God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. And please join me in the Easter greeting. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray together. Holy One, earth and heaven reverberate with your glory, and humans and angels sing your praises. Open our minds to your breathtaking work in the world, even as you call us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, our mentor and Savior, our friend, in whose name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. It is wonderful to be with you all this day. A warm welcome to any of our guests who are joining us who are not regular attenders here at St. Mark Presbyterian Church. There is always room for you when we have the time to come back together in this space, a room in the pew, but there's always room in this time of worship for anyone who is hungering, who is thirsting, anyone who has questions. The great thing about worship, it is a communal experience, and even if we cannot be together, there is still the opportunity to have shared voices, shared prayers, shared joy, shared concerns. And throughout this week, not just in worship, but throughout this week, through the St. Mark Spark, which is our daily uh, conversation we have every day at, in and around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, there's a chance for us to, to strengthen and be strengthened by one another and by God's Word. Also through the newsletter and throughout weekly mailings, a chance to be equipped for the days that are ahead. And finally, if you ever have a need, ever have a need of a prayer request of something from the church, do not hesitate to call the church office to send us an email. We will make sure to stay on top of that and to be in communication. Finally, a big thank you to all the folks in the church who have been so generous and so faithful in their giving through their tithes, their offerings, and their gifts, to the gifts to the One Great Hour of Sharing, and also to the Lenten Water Challenge offering. Your gifts are important, and we are so grateful for your faithfulness in giving. Now, as we continue in our worship, I invite you to please join with me in the call to worship. In the sanctuary, God, the Holy One, whose glory fills the whole earth, calls us. Beside the sea, along ordinary paths, in our homes and daily work, God calls us. We respond with our whole heart, singing God's praise and giving thanks. In steadfast love, God fulfills the divine purposes for our lives. Come, let us worship our God together. You are invited to please rise as you are able as we sing our first hymn this morning, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. It is hymn number one. song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, Casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee. Who wert and art and evermore shall be. Holy, holy, holy. Darkness hide.
beside thee. Lo, the eye of sinfulness thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, holy, holy. All thy works shall praise thy name In earth and sky and sea Holy, holy, holy Merciful and mighty God in three persons Blessed Trinity We have come to the time in our worship service where we will confess our sins together. Friends, inasmuch as God is our shepherd, let us not fear, but confess our sin that God may restore our souls. Let us confess together. O oh God, though we walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve and deliver us. Though our lips are not clean and our hearts are not pure, you call us. Forgive us, we pray, when we wander away from you, lost and at risk. Forgive us when our lives do not reflect your glory and the purposes you intend. Help us to comprehend your ways in the world. We long to feel your grace and glory, for in you, Emmanuel, we are healed and set free. In Jesus' name, we pray. We now come before God in silent confession. Friends, the promise of our faith is that if we entrust ourselves to the one who judges justly, we need not feel threatened, for we will be returned to righteousness. God who raised Jesus from the dead has not given us over to death. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Having been brought back into the safety of God's fold, let us share our peace with those who we are with and with one another virtually. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Last week we heard the story of Elijah's encounter with the divine. In this story, Elijah is on the mountaintop, and at first there is a violent, a mighty wind, but God is not in the wind. Then there is an earthquake, but God is not in the earthquake. And after that, there is a fire but God is not in the fire. And then the scripture tells us, in the sound of sheer silence, God appears to Elijah. We're told that Elijah gets up, he steps out of the cave on the side of the mountain, he covers his face, and he enters God's presence. This week we get to hear about another theophany, another experience, appearance of God to a human. In this week's reading, it is from the prophet Isaiah. Elijah, Elijah has this encounter with God in the quiet. And for Isaiah, it is a 180 degree turn, 180 degrees different 
as Elijah's vision emphasizes God's power, God's majesty, God's holiness in this time with the divine. And so I invite you with open ears and a soft heart to listen as God speaks to us from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the whole temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. The pivots of the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go out for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. In chapter 16 of the story, things are going south, both literally and figuratively. The northern kingdom of Israel is no more in this chapter. The Assyrians, which they were part of what is now modern-day northern Iraq and southern Turkey, they overtook the ten tribes of Israel, moved the inhabitants away, and as one story ends, the legend of the lost tribe of Israel, tribes of Israel, begins. That nation The nation of Israel will never return, and the people are forever displaced and lost in antiquity. And the text now shifts and moves south to the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel had many kings. None of them were good. Judah had many kings, and a handful followed the Lord, including who we hear about in this week's reading, Hezekiah the king. Now here was a man who kept the faith, a leader who honored God. He repelled the Assyrians, the Assyrians who conquered Israel. Judah repelled them, not so much Hezekiah in his own strength, but relying on a whole lot of divine intervention. It is a fascinating story, and if you are ever in Jerusalem, get a chance to go visit the Holy city, there is still a time and a place that you can go and walk through Hezekiah's tunnel, this tunnel that brought in fresh water into the city during the siege. But Hezekiah dies eventually, and his son goes back, not to God, but goes back to the pagan ways. The successors abandon God, and the whole situation begins to go south as leaders turn their backs on God, and citizens turn their backs on one another. This continues the decline of the monarchy in Israel and Judah. The title of this chapter is the beginning of the end. Now there's some debate, at least for me, is this the beginning of the end or is this the end of the beginning? I suppose it matters what lens we read the Bible through. Are we reading the Bible as as something of condemnation Are we reading, even in these hard and difficult stories and times, a message of hope that is still echoing through? And a mighty prophet emerges named Isaiah. He comes on the scene in Judah, but the news he brings initially, it is not good. It is that God has been paying attention that the 
Leaders have abandoned the Lord's ways. The people are mistreating one another. There is pain ahead. There is prophetic judgment. But Isaiah, in the midst of this, also has a hope for the future. A word of truth there that we will get to later on in this story. Now, Isaiah is a long book. If you've ever tried to sit down and read it, it is almost impossible in one sitting. It speaks to both Israel and Judah. These two countries cannot get things together within, and so they will be attacked from without. And Isaiah is really broken up, we believe, into three different sections, emphasizing a time that is before the Babylonians come and lay siege to the city. There's a time that's written, the second part, in exile, and the third on the return home. And today's reading is from the first part of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet has an ecstatic vision of the divine. He looks up and into the sky, he sees a throne high and lofty. He sees the hem of God's garment. It is so long and so grand that it fills the entire temple down below. Now there are seraphs, these angels that are flying around. There are six winged creatures. Two of their wings cover their face, two of their wings cover their feet, and two of them fly. This is a holy place. You take off your shoes on holy ground. You cover your eyes in the midst of the holiness. And so the seraphs are doing the same thing even as they fly around. But they begin to call out, saying, holy, holy, holy. And then this divine and immense smoke fills the room. And even as Isaiah looks up, even as Isaiah sees all of this, he has to be wondering, what in the world am I doing here? This is not where I parked my car. This is not where I'm supposed to be at. I'm in the wrong place. What is a mortal doing seeing all of this? Now, by all accounts, Isaiah has lived and lives an exemplary, God-honoring life. He's done what the Lord wants. He follows the Lord's decrees and the Lord's instructions. And yet, in the presence of the Almighty, all he can see of himself is the filth of his life and the muddiness of his lips. Now, the same would be true in our current age if we thought of say, Billy Graham or Mother Teresa or any number of the modern-day saints, the reaction would be the same. Being good on earth is one thing. It is something we should strive for. But in the presence of God's holiness, we are nothing more than a big mess. In our own home, we are developing all kinds of new hobbies, new patterns, new structures in this new normal. And one of the things we're doing quite a bit is cleaning. Now there are the routine cleaning that we go by maybe once a day or several times, which it seems like we're always, always sweeping up the kitchen. But getting the kids to clean their rooms every day. Now when we'll ask one of our children, he will remain nameless. It's done surprisingly fast any time we ask when he finally agrees to it. And we say, there's no way in the world it is clean yet. And so I'll go in to check and say, it's not done. Keep working. And he'll say, it's done. And so I check again. I check again and again. It's better, but it's not totally clean because you see our kids have a standard. And then I have a standard, but then... The good housekeeping, Burgess' seal of approval is not mine, but it is Sarah's. It belongs to her. It's not clean until mom says it is clean. Perhaps you're going around the house doing a lot more cleaning these days as well. And the one thing we will notice, there are the things we do to clean on a daily basis. And there are things that we'll look and we'll say that might never get totally clean. So it is with our lives as well with God in our more honest moments we might, admit, we might admit that we are simply trying to justify ourselves. We might go to God and say, it's good enough. Basically saying, well, I'm good enough. I know there are some, some problems, but I'm pretty good. I am good enough. We might try to justify it by saying, our rooms are not as dirty as my siblings or the people down the street. I'm better than those 
people. We might simply say, I've done enough. But here we are judging by our own standards and we use a sliding scale. We are very generous with the curve. In the presence of God, we are not getting grades like A, B, C, D, and F. We are getting pass-fail grades. And if we're honest again, we've made too many mistakes. We will never pass, at least on our own. And so here is Isaiah in the story, feeling completely unworthy. Immediately he is in God's presence and he senses, I don't belong here. I am unclean, like a coal miner that has just finished a shift working in the earth, covered in soot, trying to attend a Long Island summer white party. He doesn't belong and he knows it. Isaiah says, woe, woe is me. I am lost. I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. The people around me, the nation around me, they are unclean as well. And yet, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This vision is so incredible. And and if you have some time today, if you'd like to, if you're artistically inclined, try to draw this picture just to try to get a grasp on how incredible and awesome it truly is. We sang about it in the first hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. And Isaiah in the midst of that holy says, Who am I? Why me? I might have thought I was doing pretty well until now. Because the truth is our money does not get us into heaven. Our talent doesn't get us into heaven. Our church attendance does not get us into heaven. There is nothing we can do. It's what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 3. There is no one who is righteous. No, not one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. And Isaiah knows this. And still God reveals God's self to Isaiah because there is a purpose and there is a logic and there is a plan to all of this. To experiencing the truth. The first part of this is seeing the truth and hearing the truth. This is the first step in the relationship with Isaiah and God and with ourselves, with God, seeing the truth. The truth is the holiness of God uncovers our shame. Just as light reveals dust, even after a thorough cleaning, God is just, God is holy, and we are not. When we see the truth, we can hear the, qu- the truth quickly following. The words of the seraph that are going around Isaiah's head. And the question is, what about our own lives? There is so much misinformation in the world. There are so many lies and half-truths being shared right now. Some of it is shared out of ignorance. Some of it is shared out of fear. And there's other people in the world who are actively and purposefully working to create fear and panic in our lives. Like Pontius questioning Jesus, we might ask the same question amidst all of this, what is truth? I read an article this week in Christianity Today, and it talked about how Christians are some of the worst offenders. According to the article that was published, Christians are more prone to believe and spread conspiracy theories. And this has increased during the global pandemic. The point of this article, which is valid and true, is that when we share things that are untrue, we hurt our witness about the truth of God's love, the truth of the good news, the truth of God's plan for the world. We need to see the truth. We need to hear the truth. And then we need to accept these things that are true. Now we might say in the presence of God, what else could Isaiah have done? God who is holy and mighty, would we not do the same things? It is Isaiah who says, I am unclean. The psalmist realizes this. The apostle Paul himself calls himself the chief among sinners. 
Isaiah says, the psalmist says, Paul says, we might say we don't belong in the presence of the divine. And yet God welcomes Isaiah. And yet God welcomes us as well. It's not because we, what we have done. It's not because of what we have earned. It's not because of what we have achieved. It is grace. Pure, unfiltered grace that allows Isaiah to be in the presence of the divine or for any of us seeing the truth and hearing the truth and accepting this truth allows us to join in with the likes of good old Hank Williams in singing, I saw the light. I wandered so aimless, life filled with sin, I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. So it's one thing to see the truth, to hear the truth, to accept the truth. But we are called to live into the truth as well and speak the truth. Isaiah recognizes his lips are unclean. He recognizes he's part of a people whose words are unclean. But then the seraphs do something incredible. They take a hot coal from the altar, a live coal from the altar, and place it on his lips. And instead of burning his lips, his lips are made clean. His life is made clean in the process. It says, your guilt has departed, your sin is blotted out. And then the question comes from the Lord, whom shall I send? Who will go forth for us? And now that Isaiah is made clean, he says, here I am, send me. Now in our world, the lie is always cheaper than the truth. The truth costs more. It costs more for the prophets. It costs more for Jesus. It costs more for the disciples. It costs more for us. But the truth is what we are called to speak. To speak it in love for sure. But the truth is what we're supposed to see, what we're supposed to accept, what we're supposed to speak. In this era of misinformation, we have to be careful, church. The leaders I respect the most are the ones who respect me enough by speaking the truth, even if they are hard truths to hear. Those who acknowledge the past pain and the suffering that is yet, yet to come. Hard truths are better than soft lies, especially during this time in the pandemic. And I think that question comes to each and every one of us, not to the leaders on the national level or the state level or the local level. The question is the same one to, that went from God to Isaiah. Who am I going to send out in the world to bear the truth? Who am I going to send out who will go out for us? Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. The message the prophet gives is not an easy one for the people to hear, but it is truth. There are difficult days that are ahead, compounded all the more by the pain that's already been in the past. There will be pain. There will be exile. There will be desolation. The royal tree of Jesse will be cut, leaving only a stump. And the days ahead for us will be hard, my friends. I care too much about you to say anything other than this. We've all lost something, and we will all lose something more before this pandemic has run its course. But it does not mean that God is done with us. It does not mean that God has abandoned us. It does not mean that God's hand is not with still all of us. The truth is God can still use this time, and God can still use you, each and every one of of us. There is a plan at work even if we cannot always see, and it begins to be revealed to us when we see the truth, when we accept the truth, when we share the truth, when we live into the truth, and when we hear God ask, whom shall I send? And we can say with lips that are made clean by the grace and love and mercy of God, here I am. Send me.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and Amen. Wherever you are, if you are able, please stand as we stand together to affirm our faith using the Westminster Confession of Faith, Shorter Catechism, Question 1. What is our chief end? Our, our chief, chief end is, is to glorify God, God and, and to, to enjoy God, God forever. forever. Please find a comfortable chair and have a seat as we enter before God to offer our offerings of time and talent and treasure. Church, our God has prepared a table before us, and our cup overflows. So let us give generously from our common wealth as our way of praising God and giving to those in need. Let us pray. Holy and generous God, you have anointed us and we are yours. Bless these our tithes, our offerings of time and talent and treasure, that they may become green pastures and still waters for any and all who need your comfort and restoration. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from north and from south, from east and from west to be at this table in the kingdom of our Lord. According to the Gospel of Luke, after Jesus had risen from the dead, his disciples did not recognize him on the Emmaus Road, but after a long day's walk, after they had planned to stop, they invited Jesus in to eat, and he took the bread. He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them, and when they received it, their eyes were opened, and they knew it was the Lord. This is the Lord's table. Our God invites all those who trust in Him to share in the feast which He continues to provide. Will you please join with me in prayer? Loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give You thanks for this table. We give You thanks for this bread and for this cup. We give You thanks, Lord, for Your Word read and Your Word proclaimed. We give You thanks, God, that You are a God of light and a God of truth. There is no falsehood in you. These truths are sometimes difficult to bear, God, but in these truths you are calling us to be holy and you are calling us to be whole. And so, God, strengthened by your word, strengthened by the sacrament, we ask, Lord, that we might truly seek to be your people, that we might answer that question, who will go for God by saying, here I am send me. Almighty God, you meet us where we live, and you invite us to be part of your purpose. All thanks and praise belong to you, for you hear our prayers. Our prayers for the church and for the world and for all who live in it. And so we pray, God, for the church. We pray for all who work to bring others a word of compassion. We pray, Lord, knowing the church has left the building. We pray, God, for strength and for encouragement. We pray, God, that we all might have glimpses of this grace and manna for the journey that is ahead, that we could exhibit your kingdom and your truth. We pray, God, for peace among the nations and peace in our community. We pray, God, for places where there is suffering, where there are suffering, where there is countless acts of violence and bloodshed. We pray, God, for people who are despairing and are without hope. We pray, God, for those who are in care facilities right now. 
for those who are separated from loved ones, and for their family and friends who so desperately long to be together. We pray, God, for those who are mourning, for those who are lamenting, for those who are grieving losses of friends and family, losses of jobs and stability, losses of hope. We pray, God, that you be in this bread, that you be in this cup. We pray, God, that in this bread we might taste that you are good and that you would feed our spirits. And in this cup, you would nourish our souls. As we not only remember what your sacrifice was in Jesus Christ, but also, Lord, we look forward to the glad reunion where you will wipe away every tear. The glad reunion where you will serve a feast and we will be in your presence and the light will never fade. We pray also, God, this be daily bread for us today. Strengthening us for your purpose to hear your good news, to see your good news and truth, to accept this grace for ourselves and to share that truth with others. Lord, you know all of our needs before we ask them. You know what is weighing on our hearts. And so in this time of silence, we pray that you hear the individual request we lift up to you. Lord, we ask that you be with all the prayers spoken aloud, those in our hearts, those known only to you, and that you be near to us as we, your followers, pray the prayer that you taught all disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He thanked God for it, and then he broke it. And he said, take Eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and remember me. For as often as we, his disciples, we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the death and the resurrection of our Lord until he comes again. It is such a powerful thing that we can still share communion with one another. We can still be part of the sacrament, taking part of it, even as we are not together. We recognize the good news that wherever the Holy Spirit is, that God is at work, wherever people gather in Christ's name, that God is doing a new and a wonderful thing. So as we prepare to take the bread, I'm going to invite you to have that set up in front of you. We're going to have the words spoken. We're going to pause for a moment and invite you to partake of that and to share that with any who are with you. And then in like fashion, we'll do that with the cup. This is Christ's body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the cup of salvation poured out for you. Jesus said, drink it and remember me.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life, now and forever. Amen. Now, if you are able, wherever you are, rise together as we sing our final hymn, I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I, who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright, who will bear my light to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of snow and rain, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. I will break their hearts of stone, give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them, whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of wind and flame, I will tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them. My hand will save. Finest bread I will provide till their hearts be satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Now, as you go out into the world, may you be people who hear the truth, who accept the truth, who share that truth. Sometimes the reality is the world around us is hard and the times are difficult. But the good news, the truth, capital letter T, truth for our lives is that God's grace never leaves us. So may you go out into the world being bearers of this good news, being bearers of this truth. 
Go out into the world and may you be the church. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may it be with you this day, this life, and always. Amen. Thank uh-huh.